Amen, amen. Wow, awesome, amen. Man, I am so excited and uh, we are so blessed to have Daryl Schultz come share with us this morning. He's going to help uh, lead us through the painting of Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Last Supper. And, and Daryl, as you know, um, we call him our media coordinator, but pretty much he does a lot of stuff behind the scenes at church. And uh, he's an amazing teacher as well. Oh. Oh, yeah, don't worry. I'll send them out. Um, also, Kingdom Kids, all those that are kindergarten through fifth grade, you guys can go now. Head out this way. So if you're kindergarten through fifth grade or the mentality of kindergarten through fifth grade, you are welcome to go. Um, it's going to be an awesome time back there for Kingdom Kids. Yay! Got some good, good, awesome surprises for you today. It's going to be great. All right. Daryl's going to join with us uh, this morning. Man, he does so much behind the scenes, and we know uh, we really just appreciate all he does. And uh, y'all give him a warm welcome this morning. Are you listening? <laughs> Not to me, the Holy Spirit. Um, Monica, it was nice to see you back there. In case you didn't notice, I was crying back there, too. There's a message for somebody here today, and it's not through me, it's the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking you again, are you listening? We just watched these children walk out. That's a marvelous thing. And can we have that first slide? The Lord's words himself. But Jesus said, let the, let the children alone. Do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You know, the part that it's easy for adults to miss in that is that we're God's children. He sees us the same way. Are you listening? Yesterday, I had a lesson taught to me by God through my grandson. He's going he's gonna to be three years old in five weeks. Those of you who know him, he has severe autism. He can't speak. He's never said, I love you, Mommy, or I love you, Daddy. But he taught me something yesterday without saying a word. My wife and I bought this little desk that has a chalkboard on it and a little stool. And he was sitting out yesterday. And he was playing with the chalk and it was falling on the floor and it was breaking. <laughs> so he set the pieces back up there. And all of a sudden he took the tiniest little sliver, just the littlest piece, and he made a strong line across there. And it hit me. Something small can make a bold mark in this world. And that's the lesson today for all of us, those children that are out there and you children. We're frail. We're all going to pass away someday from this world. But don't miss the chance to make a bold mark for God while you have it. And by the way, for those kids back there, enjoy your toenails while you can still see them. <laughs> It gets harder to trim those toenails the older you get and the more weight you put on. <laughs> now, I don't know, maybe some of you are like me, but some of these uh, things we've had to do for decades, you can get tired of them. For me, shaving. Can anyone relate to that? <laughs> now, those of you who've known me for a long time know that I'm somewhat reluctant to go through that drudgery. I've been doing that since I was in seventh grade, and frankly, I've just gotten tired of it. Uh, I don't know why. It used to be when I'd shave, it'd take 30 seconds. Now it takes 30 minutes and three seconds to vacuum up the hair that comes off. You know, <laughs> I spend more time looking for where the hairs are growing now than anything else. So. Anyway, definitely I've grown tired of it. But when I'm looking in the mirror at those times, it hits me. God has a tremendous sense of humor, a great <laughs> sense of humor. So uh, I'll be shaving away and... Dad, when did you move into the house with me? <laughs> you know, things have changed. For example, this is what I looked like 40 years ago. A little bit different than today, I think you'll say here. And I, I tell my wife, this is what I look like, though, now. <laughs> now, I know some of them, we've got a guest here today. Thank you for coming. We've got people online that are thinking, is this guy a preacher? No, I am not a preacher. <laughs> I was a teacher and educator for 30 years. 
And uh, during that time, I learned something very important. That's the first thing here. If you don't hear anything else, make sure you catch this, that Christians, whether they're pastors or they're laity and teachers have something in common. That's it. Those you address usually don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, don't miss the last two words, about them. What is today, folks, in the church calendar? It's Palm Sunday. People miss this point. This is the day where Jesus began to show how much he cared about you. He gave his life for us. You got to understand something here. We, we, we have a limited mind. And the people that were there that day on Palm Sunday, they were thinking it was all about a king and a kingdom. They didn't need a king any more than we need a king. What do we need? A savior. And Jesus was that savior. All right, let's start out here with some scripture. You don't need to turn to it. It'll be up there. Mark chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 22 and 23. And they came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a man who was blind to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Now, this can be kind of hard to read. There's a lot of pronouns in here. But fortunately for us, we have the capital H, and that stands for whom? Jesus. So what's the lower H in this? That's the blind man, correct. Taking the man who was blind by the hand, he, that's Jesus, brought him, the blind man, out of the village. And after spitting in his eyes, the blind man, and laying his, Jesus' hands on him, Jesus, he asked, do you see anything? We're all kind of blind, folks. Jesus could just as well be saying that same sentence to us. Do you see anything? Do you see what I've done for you? Do you see how you betrayed me? It's going to be a major point today. Mark 8 now, verse 24. And he looked up and said, I see people, for I see them like trees walking around. 25. Then again he, Jesus, laid his hands on his eyes, and he, the blind man, looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. Now, Here's the point that's easy to miss. Jesus gave this man sight so he could see. That means that the cones and the rods and the eyes were able to send a message to the brain. But being able to see doesn't mean that you have the ability yet to interpret what you see. He only physically gave him the ability to see. Now, now the wives in here are going to appreciate what I'm going to say. If the husbands miss this, the wives will probably take this as a note. Husbands, looking at something doesn't mean you necessarily interpret what it's, is being said. I saw this all the time with my dad. He would sit there with this kind of look on his face. When mom was trying to get him to interpret something, she wanted him to understand. Now, she might say, I can read you like a book, but he tried not to understand what she was saying <laughs> conversely. Now, I wasn't the typical, uh, stereotypical classroom teacher. Now, all of you, I want you to think back of when you were in school and you had this happen to you. Maybe not to you, but you saw it happen. A teacher would say, la, 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 who knows the answer to this? And someone would blurt out the answer. What would the teacher do? That's right. Raise your hand. The teacher wanted you to raise your hand. Now, I started observing before I ever got in the classroom as a teacher, and I thought, this is kind of strange. You're asking people to raise their hand. After a while, people quit raising their hand. Now, as I was thinking about this in the sermon, I started thinking about people in this congregation and how it must have been like when they used to raise their hand in school. So we have a vivacious, spunky redhead among us. <laughs> I won't use any names, but I was picturing her sitting in school. And she, yeah, yeah, she hears the question. She's doing one of these. Remember this? They'd step outside the realm of their desk, you know, so they get attention, and then their arm would get tired, and what would they do? They'd hold it up with the other hand like that, right? You remember that? We have a, an audio director back here, and I can imagine. I better raise my hand before they think I'm stupid or something like that. And, and his wife, who's not in here so I can pick on her, 
I've noticed whenever we sing the song, Love Lifted Me, she does a little bebopping, you know? And so I can see her when the teacher asks a question. And I was having so much fun just thinking about these people. There's another guy in here who, who admits that he's a little bit ADHD, and I, I can imagine he got a little, little uh, music going on in his head there in the teacher. And all of a sudden, oh, oh. His wife, on the other hand, would have been like this. Put your hand down. You're embarrassing yourself, and you're probably about to embarrass me. One more I was thinking about here from our congregation. He probably was like, everybody put your hands down. Are you going to keep school going on too long? i got to get home and get a beer. <laughs> now, I handled this differently. I decided one year, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell my students, if you don't know the answer, I want you to raise your hand. If you do know the answer, what? Keep your hands down. Made it a whole lot easier for me. I only had to look at the one or two people. You know what else that did? Kept everybody wide awake. Because if you didn't have your hand up, what was I going to do? I was going to call on you. That's how it worked. So first day of school, had a new principal, and we had these these big red oak doors with glass next to a partition. He was looking in there, and I was just teaching, and all of a sudden he opened the door and said, Mr. Schultz, can I talk to you? Doesn't sound like a real good sign on the first day with a new <laughs> principal. So I went out there, and he said, man, I've never seen anything like this in a teacher. You have total command of that class. You have 100% participation. Every time you ask a question, everybody wants to, they're all shooting their hands up all over the room. <laughs> I'm bad. I'm bad. What I didn't tell him was they're all raising their hands because nobody knows the answer to the question. <laughs> so see, here's the point though in that. He didn't understand what was going on because he didn't have the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey's the rest of the story? He was missing the rest of the story. So he misinterpreted what was going to happen here. So I want to talk today about art and how it ties in with Christian things. So let's go to this next slide here. Need some fan participation here. I just want you to look at these two works. These are two clay masks done by former students of mine. If you prefer the one that says the number one next, just give me a little clap here. Let's see here. How many like one compared to two? Nobody claps. All right. Oh, okay. We have a few. Okay. How about number two? Who likes number two better? Okay. All right. Now, I can give you a lot of detail on both of these. The, the number one was done by a student of mine who worked for the newspaper, very black and white, you know, thinks within the box and so forth. And so she was trying to be very naturalistic, make things look the way it appears in nature. The other one, well, man, that's got a mouth that's bigger than Julia Roberts. I mean, it is a one big mouth with a lot of lipstick on it. When I looked at it, you know, having to grade it, I have to grade on a lot of things. I had to grade on how much talent does this student really have? You know, how much effort do they really put into this to reach their potential? But here's the key thing. To really be able to evaluate, I had to know the story behind it. Now, here's what you don't know. Let me tell you the story. This might change your thinking. The mask that says number two on it was done by a young lady who was recovering from cancer. So if you look at it, she's put false eyelashes on it. The mouth that's oversized was to emphasize how happy she was to still be alive. The hair, it's false hair, miscolored. It was all a statement about being saved from death. And boy, what a theme that is today. Palm Sunday, Jesus coming in, palms laid in front of him and people saying, Hosanna, you know, hallelujah. Completely different story though when you know what's behind that. All right, now, the main thing that, the main guy I'm going to talk about today is a guy named Leonardo da Vinci. So, here's a quote from da Vinci that ties in with what we said. Nothing can be loved or hated unless it is first understood. That's a great lesson for everybody that's a Christian. If you really want to love someone and show them how much you care about them, you've got to understand where they're coming from. Jesus understands. The title today of my my sermon, in case you didn't see, is judging a book beneath its cover. And that's what Jesus is able to do. And you know what? He'll judge everyone someday that way. There's nothing we can hide from him that he doesn't already know. All right. So, question. Who is 
Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Not this one. I remember years ago when my son called and said, Dad, can I watch a show with Alan called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I was like, what? <laughs> and he started to explain, oh, it's about these four turtles. They got this radioactive goo on them, and they're, they're being trained by a master rat in the art of ninja. I was like, what? I said, and, and, and who are these turtles? And he said, oh, they're, they're, they're named, you're going to like this, this best part, they're named after famous Renaissance artists. I'm sure somebody here knows. Who are they? Yeah. Raphael's one of them. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo. Michelangelo, and, Donatello. yeah, I knew you'd know him. I knew Brandon would know him. <laughs> Donatello. But since I, <laughs> as, as soon as I heard that, though, I told him, I said, no, you can't watch that show. I said, one of the things, it, it's going to, Screw up your mind before you go to school because if you know Donatello, uh, he was way before the rest of them. He he would have been carrying a cane and that's what he would have beaten everybody with because he would have been the grandfather. <laughs> he wasn't a teenage. Now Leonardo, when Donatello died, was 14, so he would have been a teenage mutant ninja turtle. But by the time Michelangelo rolled around, Donatello was gone, and Raphael comes later, and then Michelangelo lives them all way out there. So the whole Precept didn't make sense to me, so I said, you know, so, no, you're not going to watch that show. All right, let's go to this slide here. Leonardo da Vinci, of course, was known for all sorts of things. He was, he was truly the Renaissance man. This is an equestrian horse design that he had worked on. It was never finished during his lifetime. In fact, his model was shot to pieces during the war. Uh, he had started the work on it, and it had to be stopped because they needed the metal. They needed the metal to use for weapons, so it was shot to piece. Done almost 500 years later. Next. So, you, it's a little hard for you to see here. The people on the internet will be able to see this easier, but in the upper left-hand corner, his study of botany. Loved to study botany and nature. Below that, the, the physics, the physics of water and water power. Upper right-hand corner, probably the thing Leonardo loved more than anything else was the study of flight. Whether it was birds or, as you can see, this invention he had. He invented things that wouldn't come for centuries later, and then the lower right-hand corner, that represents architecture. Here in the upper left-hand corner, we recognize this. What is this? Well, this is his idea of a bicycle, his concept of a bicycle. So you can look through that, and you'll see several things that uh, might look familiar. Helicopter, submarine, and an armored car that, in essence, was the first concept of a, you know, a tank. Another thing Da Vinci did that he could have gotten a lot of trouble with, could have gotten excommunicated in his days, we did anatomical studies, some 30 cadavers that he cut apart, and he was among the first to really document the reproductive system and everything that uh, you know, occurred with that. But he wasn't a physician, so that was against the law. You have to understand that he was wearing outside the realm of the law to do this. Mirror writing. Now, some of you may have heard of his mirror writing. He taught himself to write in reverse so that what he wrote in his sketchbooks, he did in his thousands of pages of sketchbook notes, held up to a mirror would be able to be read correctly. Now, when he wrote something somebody else, he wrote normally. Now, why would he do that? Well, Leonardo was one of the world's most famous lefties, left-hander. Now, that has changed a lot. And I tell this to young people all the time. You cannot understand how much things have changed since I was a child. When I was in school, if you were left-handed, and I saw it, the teacher would tie your hand to the side with a belt so you couldn't use your left hand and you had to work right-handed. They would say, we don't have any left-handed desks, so you must write right-handed, you know, instead of having them bend around, you know, with their hand like that. Leonardo was doing something that makes all the sense in the world. If you're left-handed and you're writing and you're writing in reverse and mirror writing, you're not smudging the ink with your hand. It makes all the sense in the world. So the man was a a literal genius. Now something that our pastor will like because Pastor Brandon's admitted at times that he likes to procrastinate. Da Vinci was a procrastinator. He was an originator but not a finisher at all. Many times he'd take the money for the project, he'd walk away or he just wouldn't finish the project whatsoever or he would try to do it in another way that would fail and then he'd walk away from the project and so forth. Well, there's another very famous artist. You've heard his name, probably not pronounced this way, Vincent von Hoch. You got to be careful not to say that when you have a cold. <laughs> Americans call him Vincent Van Gogh. Do you know how many paintings Vincent Van Gogh sold during his lifetime? One. One painting. Leonardo, a little bit different. 
Let's go to this. Who's, who's the one on the left? Um, moaning Lisa. She's tired of having her picture taken. <laughs> she l- held that pose for too long. Picture on the right means nothing to you. That's the most expensive painting ever sold. $450 million by Leonardo da Vinci. A man who has roughly 15 paintings he finished in his lifetime. Oh, and by the way, Vincent, who only sold that one painting while he was alive, he has, uh, I think, nine works now in the, that have sold for more than $72 million. So it's all a matter of getting to understand what's going on there. And Leonardo had his own vision on how to do this and learning how to see. All right, I'm going to read from Matthew 26 now, verses 20 through 25, but I'm just going to start with verses 20 and 22. Verse 20, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. Now, who are the twelve? They're the disciples. Um, also called apostles. Some people consider the disciples the original 12 and the apostles those that were sent out in the next group and so forth. Um, now obviously Judas was a disciple uh, but not an apostle in that regard since he committed suicide and, sp- and didn't spread the message after the resurrection. Verse 21, and while they were eating he said, now who's the he here? This is Jesus. He said, truly I tell you one of you will betray me. Verse 22, They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Matthew 26, 20 through 22 in the NSB. Now, I want to stop just a moment and I want to switch to a different version. We're going to go from this one to the King James Version. I'm going to reread 20 through 22 here. All right, it says, Now when the evening was come, he, now what do you see? Just notice here. Is different. Sat down. He sat down with the twelve. Now I'm going to stop right there. Here's here's the situation. We face this as Christians when we're witnessing. People are saying the Bible contradicts itself. These versions contradict each other. Well, I want to try to clarify that a little bit right now. So let's turn to this painting. That's the main subject today. Go ahead, Andrea. Leonardo da Vinci's famous Last Supper. Some people call it the Lord's Supper, but there's a differentiation you need to make there. The Lord's Supper is more associated with the Eucharist, the distribution of the elements, the, the, the fruit of the vine and the bread, whereas the Lord's Supper would be more the Passover meal celebration here. So um, <clears throat> if you want to ever go see this painting, it's in terrible condition. Um, you have to make your reservation. Uh, you only get 15 minutes to see it, and you'll be in there in Milan, Italy with about 25 other people, and you'll quickly get out of there. But if you want to go, you need to understand something first. It's in Milan in a place called, in in the refectory. Now, you probably don't know what a refectory is, but it's really important. That word is, it can be translated, a place where you're restored. This is the dining hall. This is the dining hall of a former monastery. So the monks and the nuns would have been sitting in the dining hall looking at what? That painting. Every day they ate, they would be seeing the Last Supper. In fact, Da Vinci, using perspective, made it look like it extends out from the actual wall so that they were sitting in the same room that Christ was eating in. It's it's awesome. But the way he's portrayed it, look how they're squeezed in. They can barely fit in this picture, you know. But it makes sense when you think about it. When they're eating there, they don't want to see the backs of some of the apostles. They want to see them all. So he squeezed them all on one side of the table. Now, the extension changes things a little bit. This is an important one. It's kind of hard for you to see, but I want you to understand. This is more likely the way they ate. Not by sitting at a table, but reclining. You have to understand the Passover was a celebratory meal. It was a celebration of being freed from what? Slavery in Egypt. So they would have taken up the Persian and the Roman way of leaning here in this U- around this U-shaped table. The middle section was open so that the servants could get in there easily to serve the food to people. But they would have laid on their left side like this, and that freed their right hand to eat with. Now, you have to understand a lot of cultures, and even if you take the, the word Latin uh, for left, it's translated sinister. Left side, left-handedness was bad. And so you would lean on the left and you eat with the right hand. Now, in this picture, and I'm going to show you another one in just a second here, Christ would have been the host of the meal. 
where he sent his, his disciples ahead of him. He would have been the second person on the left and the first person on the left to his right-hand side would have been a trusted friend. And we'll get into that in just a second. So let's go to the next slide. Here's the positioning. You can see it a little bit clearer here. John would have been the person in the seat right next to Christ. Now, here's the funny thing about it, and that's why Brandon has graciously allowed him the time. The person in the seat to the left of Christ would have been the honored guest. You see who it is? Judas Iscariot was the honored guest at the last meal. How interesting. See where Peter is? He's on the other side of the table. You know what that position was on the triclinium? That's what this is called, the triclinium. That's the position where a slave would have normally sat to be able to go to the door and bring more food and drink in. So Peter was put in a very humble position in this picture. Now, one other thing about this that I want you to consider from John 12, 2 and 3. You remember there was a story where Jesus was in Bethany with Lazarus and others, and he was reclining and eating and Mary came and did what? She anointed his feet with perfume. Now, if Christ was sitting at Da Vinci's table, she would have had to crawl under the table to anoint his feet. <laughs> or ask him, could you swivel on your seat, please? I want to wash your feet. How would it have been done here? The feet would have been right behind him. She would have been able to walk around beside him and anoint it without anybody seeing right away. So that's something to take in mind. All right, next slide. This is Da Vinci's Last Supper again. I want you to notice something. Just talked about feet. Christ's feet are missing in the painting. You know why? A door. <laughs> in 1652, this painting was so unrecognizable, so betrayed from its original value, that they actually cut a door through the wall, which was a huge mistake. Da Vinci's work... Um, it, well, of course, here in America, we don't have many things that have survived more than 100 years. This work's 500 years old. It's a miracle it survives, and maybe only because of God's blessing on it. But this work has faced things you could not imagine that have happened. For example, Napoleon's troops used this as a horse stable, and they threw rocks and dung at the wall. They climbed up on ladders and gouged out the eyes of the apostles. The the painting done by da Vinci was a totally experimental method he tried to do on a, on a wall in an area prone to flooding. So immediately, practically, the, the work started flaking off the wall. He didn't paint the traditional uh, fresco technique. Remember, he was a procrastinator. Traditional fresco, you'll put just as much plaster on the wall that you can paint with the, a watercolor-like mixture in one day, and then you stop. And then you put that much down the next day. He did the whole wall with a heavy base coat of lead to start with and then tried his experimental technique because he wanted more luminous uh, colors. He wanted more time to do the detail in oils, but it was a catastrophe. As time went along, the monks even put a curtain in front of this so they could try to protect it from the atmosphere. But, you know, think about that. Now you caused a, a vapor barrier between the curtain and the wall. The humidity is stuck there, and every time you open the curtain, it flakes paint off the wall. So this painting has really faced a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble. I just want to address for a minute here the, the idea of who was on his right, John. And it, as you can see here, and I'll just read it up here, lying back on Jesus' chest. You may have heard of laying on his bosom. You've heard that before. Was one of his disciples. Which one? The one whom Jesus loved. That's John. Now, so Simon Peter nodded to the disciple. Okay, stop for a minute. Remember the triclinium? You got Peter over here. Where is John? He's over there next to Jesus. So he makes, a, he makes a comment or he makes a nod to him. Tell us who he is speaking, about what. Leonardo da Vinci's painting is based on this concept. The whole picture is based the few seconds after Jesus has says, one of you will betray me. All the reaction of the disciples is based on that concept. So here in scripture, we have Peter saying, hey, find out who this is. Which one of us is it? Then, verse 25, he, he then simply leaned back on Jesus' chest and said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, now try to picture this, okay? I'm John. Jesus is next to me. How hard would it be just to lean back and say, Jesus, who are you talking about? See? Very easy. And it would have been something private. 
that he could have just whispered it to him. So uh, very important thing there. I just wanted to put this up here. You won't be able to see it, but we do know the names of the apostles that are in Da Vinci's painting. In fact, a lot of his drawings that he did, he identified some of the people that he used there. Let's go to the next slide here. Look at the, look at the man in the lower left-hand corner. He's shrouded in darkness. You know who that is? That's Judas. Notice something else. The other two people, the one on the far right is John. He, he looks kind of effeminate, looks female-like. Well, that was very common. Da Vinci did that a lot, and a lot of artists of the time did that. And, of course, some of you have heard of Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, and so forth, and the, the idea, well, that's Mary Magdalene. Oh, now, now, think about this. You're Leonardo da Vinci in a time where you've got somebody paying you to paint this picture in a monastery, and you're going to leave out one of the 12 disciples and replace it with a female? I don't think so. That's not going to happen. That's going to be a pretty obvious oversight. Oh, and by the way, you're in Italy. What's in Rome? The Pope. I don't think you want to make him angry either. So I don't think that that's going to fit. But notice that both John and the gentleman in the middle have a halo around their head. Just think holy representative on earth. Judas does not. Next slide. I pulled back a little bit here so that you can see Judas has something in his right hand, as does Peter. Now, it's going to be hard for you to tell, but Peter has a knife in his hand behind his back. What is that foreshadowing? What's going to happen after the Last Supper? He's going to go to the Roman soldier and take the sword and cut his ear off, and Jesus is going to heal it. Let's get a little bit closer to Judas here, though. Next slide. See that? I purposely lighten this up. This is a picture of spilled salt. The last restoration of this painting started in 1979. It took over 20 years to complete. That's more than seven times that it took to paint the original. But in doing this, they found several things. One of the things uh, uh, is, is right here, the spilled salt. Spilled salt is a bad omen. It was back then a sign of betrayal. And so... Who else to show this with than, of course, Judas? Next slide. Another thing they found in the restoration right there. You know what that is? Ever heard the statement, I need that like I need a hole in the head. Da Vinci needed to put a hole in the head of Christ. This is in the right temple of Christ in the painting of the Last Supper. Next slide, and you'll see why he did this. He has these lines of perspective. Da Vinci's Last Supper is arguably the, the greatest example of one-point perspective. Notice where all the lines off the tapestries and the rafters, they all go to the central person, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it, but if you look at it here in this reproduction, you have holy numbers, numerology. You have four sets of apostles put in groups of, what, three. Three times four is... 12, 4, 3, holy numbers, 12, holy number. Now, whether you read this picture, as the Jews would have, from what direction, right to left, or our direction, left to right, you're going to have six men, and who's in the center? Jesus, six men. Six in the Bible is the number of what? Number of man. In completion, what's, what's seven? It's the number of completion. No matter which way you look at it, Jesus is the completer. Next slide. This is a better reproduction. You can go to London and see this one. Save yourself some money, too. It's free. All right, go ahead. So I'm going to show several reproduction, or several shots from this reproduction. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, well, actually, that's uh, Da Vinci's work, but I wanted to show this because you can see clearly that Christ is an equilateral triangle. Geometry was very important to cultures back then, mathematics. You know, if you stop and think about it, a triangle is uh, the one that's used, the geometric solid that takes the least amount of lines. It only takes three to make it. And it represents something that we've discussed before, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But realize the, the term Trinity isn't even in the Bible. It's, it's implied, but it's not really there. You won't find it. Now we go to the next slide here. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so, okay? Let's take a look at how this ties into the painting. 
There's the painting in London. Gives you some idea of how big it is. So as the person is standing in front of this, you can see where Jesus is, and where would Judas be? He would be to the left. In the picture here, you can see Jesus' hand and Christ's hand seem to be reaching for the same platter. Now, it, they would have been using a stone anyway. They wouldn't have been using this platter as you're seeing here. But they're both reaching for the same thing. But Christ actually looks like he's reaching for the vine, the fruit of the vine. And in the other hand would be the Eucharist, or, or the, the bread, to suggest what he's going to do next with the Eucharist. As we move on to the next group, notice they all have halos. I, I love how you got the hands up. I'm innocent. Stop. <laughs> you know? Remember, their reaction is based on, is it I, Lord? Next. So now we're going to the far end of the table, and you got old Simon here, and they're turning to him saying, did you hear that? What's, what's he saying? You know, who is this? They're all reacting, and they're in these strong groups. Now behind in this picture, you can see the tapestries. You have, you have the four tapestries and the three sections between them. Again, four and three, holy numbers. I love this. this is my, these are my favorite characters in Da Vinci's layout. So over there in the back, you have a guy with his finger up, and he says, I've got a boo-boo. <laughs> you know who that is? He has a bad nickname. Doubting Thomas. Thomas's fingers raised because that's foreshadowing what's going to happen a week later. What's Ta Thomas going to do? He's going to take that finger at the instruction of Christ and put it in the wounds. Then you have James... <laughs> reacting there with his, his hands out there, you know, in anger. We don't see the whole thing, but hopefully you'll go online and, and be able to look at it sometime. This kind of shows you the badly deteriorated condition, see, compared to the reproduction. So if you really want to see the work, you either have to go online where you can zoom in and see some reproductions or go in person to, you know, like the one in London. All right. As I'm wrapping up, I just wanted to show you a couple more slides to discuss how this painting is miraculously saved by God. Did you know during World War II, the refectory area was bombed? In fact, the bomb landed about as long as the distance of this building from the painting. But they had covered it first with sandbags, blankets, pillows, whatever they could. Next slide, and you can see the devastation. It literally blew the roof off the building. But the painting was saved. But for months, it was open air like that, causing further deterioration. So this brings me to this point, people. Back to my original point. There are some things that we've done for many years, like shaving, whatever. But unfortunately, one of the things that we haven't grown tired of is sinning. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all people that today need to ask ourselves the same question that those people were asking in Da Vinci's painting. Is it I, Lord? Is it I that you've called to come to this church, maybe become a member? Is it I, Lord, then supposed to use this musical skill or this teaching skill or whatever, and I'm, I'm betraying you? We may not have betrayed him in the same way Judas did, but we all have betrayed God through sin, and he has already paid the price with his blood for our salvation. I love Paul Phillips and his wife, Lori. You've been praying for them already for weeks, but you didn't know the rest of the story. Paul was at my wedding and he sang for me. I was at Paul's wedding 35 years ago. I love these people. At the wedding, as I stood there as the best man, I, I was amazed by something that happened. It gave me goosebumps. They had Dennis Jernigan, by the way, as their pianist at the wedding. That would impress a lot of people. But what really impressed me was when the pastor said, you're all witnesses to this wedding. If you're willing to pray for this couple and support them, won't you come up here and pray? And I felt like when somebody's staring at you and you feel that, that I was being stared at. And I looked down and there were people all the way to the back of the church, one after the other with their hands on, all the way up to her, a human train praying for her. I asked today, what's happened to the Baptists? You know, these steps aren't here just to help people get up and down. These steps are not here for somebody 
just wanting salvation to come up here. They're here for people that are in need of bending their knee before a holy God and saying, is it I, Lord, that you need to speak to today? I used to see husbands take their wives by the hand and go pray at the prayer altar. I used to see parents take their children up there and introduce them to praying at the front of the church. What has happened to that, folks? What has happened? This should be a place of comfort, not embarrassment. Now, you need to know something because I know this is a factor at some churches. When we record the services like we're doing right here, my computer operators have been told not to show anything that's going on here. There is nobody that's going to see you come up here and bow a knee because you feel I have a heinous sin and I don't want to go up there and be seen. You know what? We all have heinous sins. It only takes one sin to send you to, to death. There's nobody in this loving church that's going to judge you. If you come up here today and you want to bend a knee, that's great. You do it. In the 1980s, I was in church once where an evangelist said, is there anyone who will stand for Jesus? And I was thinking, what's, what's he mean stand for Jesus? Stand someday and be persecuted for Jesus? Does he? One man, Joe Blackford, shot up on the far left-hand side. One man in the entire congregation, like he'd been shot out of a bullet. I have never forgotten that lesson that day because I didn't stand when the Holy Spirit prompted me to. I was coming up with a different... So, is there anybody, I repeat the question, here today willing to stand for Jesus? And don't do it because I'm asking you to. Do it because you want to stand for a holy Jesus. With you standing, those that are standing, close your eyes, lower your head. I just want to tell you that there are people in here that are ready to come forward and pray. Pray for your pastor, Brandon Carter. He just lost a brother, folks. That pain has not gone away. His mother and dad have lost a son. If you're willing to, come up here and lay hands on Brandon, even as I talk, and Kim, and pray for them. There are people in here that Lord knows need to come forward and pray for salvations, not just here at New Faith, but for churches throughout the United States because things are changing, people. People are, are, they're interpreting scripture the way they want to interpret it, not the way it's written because they need someone to show them like I tried to do today with Lena, to show them how to see. Some of you may need to come up and pray today that next Sunday we'll have people here, visitors here, that can hear Brandon preach the Holy Word. Whatever it is, Billy, when you get a minute, will you play? If you need to come forward for any need, there will be people up here to meet you. Not me, the pastors up here, Chuck, Mike, anybody else will come up here. If you need to leave, feel free to step out the door with no one looking around. Let me just say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work in this place, for people to love on their pastor, but more importantly, for people to show their love for you, to show that they love you and that they are listening. They're paying attention. Just like I spoke of little Justin in the lesson he showed me yesterday. Something small that happens in here today can make a big, bold difference in somebody's life. So I pray, Lord, if there's someone heart here who's been pierced, not by anything I said, I said nothing. I just tried to repeat what you told me to say in my prayers. Lord, if there's somebody that has a need, let them come forward today and be ministered to them while Billy plays this song. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Father God, I want to thank you so much for speaking boldly through Daryl today. God, I thank you so much that I had served such a loving people, your people, and you can feel it anytime you walk through these doors. God, it is a blessing, and I never want to lose sight of what you're doing here. God, we want to hold fast to your plans and your purpose. God, help us to truly just cling to you and what you have for us. God, I pray for those that are here that are struggling through something. God, I pray that they would cling to you and know that they're not being judged by us, that they're not being um, cast out or, or looked down upon, but God, we love them just like you love us. We want them to feel and experience your truth and know who you are. God, I pray for those that are watching that maybe not know you. God, I pray that you would speak boldly through your Holy Spirit where they are right now. It may be in their house. It may be later when they're just... They have the time to watch. God, I pray that you would speak boldly to them. And if they don't know you, God, I pray that they would truly pray this prayer. 
Father God, I want to be saved. I want to truly accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I know that he did the work on the cross that I could not do. He took my sin upon himself, and he, and he died on the cross for my sin. But what's awesome is that he rose again the third day to give me hope and a future and a plan. And I want to admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, and I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's your prayer this morning, if that's the first time you've ever prayed that, I want you to contact us. Find us on email. You can check us out on the web. If you're here this morning and that's your prayer this morning, I want you to just raise your hand because I want to pray for you personally. If that's the first time you've ever made that, that decision, that's what it's all about. That's the whole reason we're here. Amen? And that's the whole reason we are celebrating next week. God has awesome and mighty, mighty things planned for this church. So much that we can't even, we can't even fathom what's going to happen within the next year. It's going to be amazing. I'm so, so excited and so honored to serve with you guys here. Amen? Amen. Y'all give Daryl another hand for just opening his heart and mind to us this morning. Awesome job. Awesome. That's right. Otis will be more than happy to share you. <laughs> I love it. He told me this morning he was getting out. He said, he said I might have to use tooth canes to get here, but I'm going to get here even if I have to crawl here. I said, amen, brother. We are glad y'all are here. Amen. God has awesome things planned for you this week. Don't forget tonight, it is our fourth Sunday night singing. Basically, it's worship night. I love our worship nights. Do not miss tonight. If you've got a friend that, uh, that may have not been in church in a long time, invite them to come tonight and obviously invite them to come Easter Sunday. Uh, we're going to prepare. We're going to give some extra chairs in here uh, because we truly believe God is going to send a lot of people here. Amen? Because he has an awesome message for them. Y'all bow with us as we close in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for this amazing, beautiful day. It is your day. And God, we want to recognize it as always your day because we want to strive after your heart every single day, everything we do. As tough as this week may be, we know we have a Savior that has a plan and a purpose for us. I pray that you be with us as we think about those that we are asking to come Easter Sunday, those that are asking to come tonight. God, I pray that you'd give us your words of what to say to them. Let us not be fearful of what we should say or how to say it. Let us just be open to let you speak through us. And God, we thank you and praise you for all you're doing. And God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us at New Faith Baptist Church today. We are honored that you worshiped with us today. If during this video you realize you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to call the number at the end of this video to speak directly with me. Also, if you have any prayer concerns or questions about anything going on at this time, please go ahead and call that number. You can also check out our website at newfaithbaptistchurch.net, and that gives you information about all the coming events and different service times and things like that. But really, the best way to get to know who we are and our awesome people here at New Faith is to come and experience.